We're not interrupting, we're starting. Welcome uh, to this evening's event, uh, Polytopes, uh, the Architecture of Soundscapes. Uh, this night is uh, hosted by the Mediascapes uh, Postgap program here at SciArc. And as the theme indicates, the night is dedicated to sounds. A night about exploring the relations of sound, space, and architecture. And also to look at architecture of sound and seek ideas for current and relevant modes of sound space uh, generation. The work with sound to generate and sound, uh, design sound, is an integral part of the Mediascapes program. Sound not as a fancy icing uh, on a spatial uh, proposal, but sound as in the cinematic arts, as an integral life form in the conception and experience of spatial propositions. This point has to be made as it is not evident, measured on the lack of sound studies offered in architectural schools. Mediascape addresses research and experimentation with media medium by studying the ontologies that transport ideas and scapes the physical and virtual field conditions, matrices, and architectural space as dynamic and responsive systems. Scapes, much as, of course, in uh, all-time favorite, in Vladislav Lem's fictional Solaris, where the sea is made of responsive matter. The work of Mediascapes involves a prime preoccupation uh, with system design and algorithmic operations. Say the design of generative principles as complex feedback systems that create new ecologies and ultimately unfold into a new experiential space, spaces. Uh, could we have the uh, video running in the back? Yeah. And then maybe move on to the next. We need to move on to the next, yes. Um, one of my favorite, the uh, anechoic chamber. It forms an interesting architectural counterpoint, an antithesis, where scapes are absorbed and deflected at infinitum nullifying reverberation and channeling feedback data into a black hole, energy engulfed and sutured into the depth of materiality, nullifying flows between body and space. What follows is a collapse of biological systems, loss of balance and loss of communications orientations, forming an inverted scape. Tonight's program, Polytopes, Poly, the multiple, and topos, uh, the place. Polytope is a mathematical term used to describe multifaceted prisms, n-phased and n-dimensional geometrical figures. But Yanis Senakis used the term polytope for a collective name and a series of multimedia pieces made of sound, light, and architecture performed in the 60s and 70s. But every polytope bears the name of the unique location where it was staged. Names and number of the spectacles uh, indicated that it was not one multimedia uh, work, but a sum of places and performances that were set in relation uh, to each other. The Zenakis polytopes are very interesting uh, because they deployed formalized mathematical principles for the composition of multidimensional space sound constructions. Born out of the three minds, of the symbiosis of the three minds, the architect for space, the engineer for structures and mathematics, and the composer for sounds, only one in Zanakis's mind. And uh, to mention the polytope, uh, the Cluny in Paris performed in 72, was a highly innovative construction based on mathematics widely extending the boundaries of harmonics and scale, 
where X was, where uh, Xenakis um, was uh, setting a forth um, a new compositional practice, de uh, deploying mathematical and algorithmic principles to construct a temporal space. Uh, tonight, our six uh, presenters uh, will discuss six polytopes and with our participation, uh, attempt to take a look and listen and discuss where the work with sound and off sound might take us and seek the next generation of our work. Uh, next, please. I'm going to present the six speakers um, rather briefly and apologize for the abbreviated um, bios I'm presenting. It's really just to give, them a, to give us a brief introduction to the participants. And they will be uh, presented in the order uh, that they are presenting. David Rosenboom is a renowned pioneer in American experimental music and well known as a composer, art, uh, artist, performer, performer, and orchestra conductor. David currently holds the chair at the Herb Albert School of Music at CalArts that recently staged Ortesia the, by Yanis Zenakis, the absolute fabulous uh, opera of mystic uh, proportions at the Wild Beast. His work, uh, in his work, David has extensively explored ideas of spontaneous evolution of form and languages for improvisation, computer music systems and compositional algorithms, propositional music and combining sound with neuroscience, self-organizing systems and theoretical physics, just to mention a few. David worked with Yanis Senakis on a number of projects and published conversations. And tonight, David will present thoughts and observations on Zenaki's early inspirations for propositional sound space uh, composition. Next. The, second uh, the second presentation uh, is by Steve Roden. Uh, Steve is a renowned artist and uh, well known at Sayark, lectured here on a number of occasions, and well known for his intricate sound and visual artwork production. Uh, his source materials are found object and architectural spaces, as in his presentation tonight, uh, a piece uniquely designed for the Sayak building, where the building is listened to, recorded, coded, and transformed through a number uh, of electronic processes, an aesthetic he describes as lowercase. Sound concerned with the subtlety and the quiet activity of listening and engaging the audience with the soundscapes. He states, a process full of impurities and incisions for intuitive momentary explorations, a practice inspired by works of John Cage, Morton Feldman, Solowit, and Alfred Jensen, leading to a fragile architecture suspended in temporary formations. Steve piece tonight is entitled Sci Arc Possible Architectures. The next uh, presentation is by Carolina Trigo, video artist, media philosopher, author, and educator based in Los Angeles. Uh, Carolina's work, uh, the black topology that uh, we projected earlier, and sound work draw on the explorations of philosophical positions, infiltrating the spaces between femininity and masculinity, participation and otherness, frailty and emergence, in the animality of remembrance and viscerality of resistance. Carolina has recently published the book Oral Osia, Sound as Architecture, referring to Stockhausen, she writes, music is materialized by using the audience as phenoms, as bouncing boards for new reverberations to a whole. He invites us to touch the music and to redefine it. We are therefore instruments, particles contributing and altering the mass and surface of the sound invading and leaving our bodies. Where to listen is to feel, to feel is to be sculpted by the impressions of the absolute. Carolina will talk about dissonant, and tap into the sound as ontology, 
focus on the interplay and dissonances between logos, principle, and the divine reason and creative order and eros as they relate in the continuity and discontinuity of thought and physicality. I hope I got that one right. Next. Juan Azulay, architect, filmmaker, media activist, and educator at SciArc. Juan's work merges architecture, cinematic arts, and an interest in biological life ecology's position at the verge of science fiction. His presentation is entitled Oral Bestiality, the Floodstains Bacterial Opera. Floodstains is the name for the bacterial opera that marks the desecration of a natural, virtual, robotic life system. The framework for the opera features a black sunken pyramid that houses a vivarium containing a sustained bacterial universe where derivatives from organic replicant and digital organisms create a hybrid ecology seeking self-stabilization. The next presentation is by Lance Putnam. Lance Putnam is an electronic and audiovisual music composer with a particular interest in, as he states, fundamental unified constructs for synthesis of sounds and graphics. He researches mathematical concepts such as complex numbers, conjugate domains, and how convolution can synthesize four motion symmetry, replication, and interaction. Today, Lance will present two polytopes, Rapture and S-Phase. Both works are studies of sonic space time structures that explore mathematical relations of sound and geometrical structures. The next uh, and last presentation is by Curtis Rhodes. Curtis is well known at SciArc. He lectured here before on a number of occasions. He's a known composer of electronic and electroacoustic music specialized in microsounds, granular and pulsar synthesis. Uh, Curtis uh, holds the chair at the MIT lab at UC Santa Barbara and is associate director of CREATE, also at UC Santa Barbara lab facility that was also used by Yanis uh, Zanakis. Uh, Curtis worked with Zanakis and also taught at his institute, the CCM Mix uh, in Paris. Curtis will take us into micro and nanospace, exploring methods of sound fragmentation, microspace, and atomic scale decomposition. So don't leave. Um, where narrative and relational states are reconstituted into granular micro soundscapes. His presentation is entitled Articulation, Articulating Space. And next. And um, we'll. Um, the different participants uh, will be joined uh, by uh, architect Greg Hodgetts uh, on the panel, forming the panel tonight. So Greg Hodgetts is our honorary uh, guest uh, tonight. Just to mention a few accolade projects uh, of his architectural practice together with uh, Ming Fung, our director here at SciArc. And the projects uh, were born uh, from a passion with performance, art of sounds, music, and cinema, um, being the redesigned Hollywood Bowl that you know, the Egyptian theater, the Art Center Performance Pavilion, the Wild Beast Pavilion at Arts, uh, Call Arts, and the extraordinary exhibition here at SciArc, the Immersive Care for You. Greg has a long-standing passion for sounds and architecture and forged a practice as innovator, never short of his sense uh, for invention. Uh, next. And now before we start, um, I want to thank uh, the many people that were uh, part of the preparation uh, of this event. Um, in particular, uh, the sonic preparation for tonight, uh, the preamble sounds that were performed by uh, the Health and Beauty Consortium, a group of SciArc uh, affiliates that will also be performing again uh, after uh, the evening, after the various presentations at the end of the night. And I want to thank all the people that helped to make this event possible. 
uh, our uh, generous donor, uh, Abby Shear, that can't be with us uh, tonight, and the continued support of the director's office, and, the, and in particular the academic director, uh, Ming Fung. Special thanks goes to Wendy Heldman, the public programs office, and Bill Cromer, the development's office, and most so to Reza Mohanan and his team for uh, the technical support. So I think we're ready to, to start with the presentations. I will start with David Rosenboom. Um, I'd like to ask the, the panelists to uh, maybe comment in between the different presentations. We, so we have a presentations um, and then take uh, with a changeover, maybe a, a two minute uh, break where we take comments from the panel and also from the audience. Maybe one or two questions from the audience uh, will be good. There are two microphones on both sides. Uh, that come off the stand that uh, you're welcome to use. So I think that much for the thanks and the organization, and I think we're ready to start with uh, David's presentation. Thank you, Jean-Michel. Uh, that's Yana Zanakis, but we'll get to that in a minute. <clears throat> uh, in uh, a, a brief presentation, what, what I intend to do is, is uh, basically give you two things. One, just a little bit of perspective from the musician's point of view about the, the consideration of sound as an articulator of space, not, not just an articulator of space, but a creator of space, and how, how composers really think fundamentally as, as uh, about sound in space, not just in time. Uh, Zanakis being one of the, of the great artists who moved the most fluidly back and forth between those two domains. Really, if one was to talk about, about uh, the relationship of music, uh, uh, or composition in particular, to architecture, it, it, one can go way, 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 way back. And I, and I would avoid the examples that we would normally think about that have to do with things like uh, placement just placement of sound sources in, a spatial, in spatial locations, but actually the articulation, the, actually the creation of space, at least that's the way it can be thought of by uh, composers in general. Uh, some of the inspirations for this uh, are hugely diverse and they, they, they cover centuries and, and as well as decades. I remember being inspired when I discovered that in the 1920s, there was a practice in, um, in the Soviet Union at that time of having factory whistle concerts with, uh, I have a, an incredible photograph of someone standing on top of a big building with flares actually conducting a city. Um, we've, we have these huge ideas. I helped publish a book on sound sculpture in the, in the um, early 1970s in which we found this. I wish we could have heard I wish we could have recorded what the result of that was, but this was a regular thing that went on. Um, a whole, you know, whole cities. Later on, artists made what we referred to actually as city pieces, using, using huge uh, uh, geographical soundscapes as well. Um, we, um, we have, uh, for, uh, here's an example um, of an early piece of mine from the 1960s, which is really, which is based on an acoustical analysis, a multi-directional acoustical analysis of outdoor spaces. This one happens to be Central Park around 71st and Central Park West. Um, and it turned out to be that you, that by an analysis of all of this, by uh, not just the sounds, but the geographical landscape, we become tuned to resonances. Resonance is a huge concept because it has to do with sound in enclosed space and how we can learn to, to hear and actually navigate space that way. And it became the basis for, of, a, of a score which then got realized and sounds kind of like this. In this case, musicians are actually responding to a map of sonic resonances from this location as it proceeds through a certain time of day.
you can hear a drone. You can hear string and wind instruments. So sometimes we find things in actually in uh, uh, graphical uh, mappings. Here's a score uh, in which um, this is, a, this is a real musical score in which every marking it has to be learned by musicians because it means something, and it's actually a mapping of sonic gestures in space. It's a mapping of actually sonic content in a, in a multi-dimensional space that uh, covers about a dozen different sound parameters. It would take too long to articulate exactly what they are, but you can see that there's a, there's a, uh, there are scales of various parameters, the, the most visible of which is density, which uh, can be mapped across an axis that goes horizontally across the, the, the uh, image. This is a big, about this big kind of circular thing. It's distorted on the screen. Uh, but it actually has to do, each of the closed uh, figures there uh, represents a, a sonic world that is articulated by people that are mapped out in space. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Sorry. There. Um, here's another one. It, this is actually a mapping of, of um, the transformations of sound in space as you move around in a, in a, uh, in a multi-dimensional location. Uh, this one actually comes from, uh, I have quite a bit of work that comes from studies of the work of the French mathematician René Tom, who wrote a book called Structural Stability and Morphogenesis, which has a lot to do with dynamical systems theory and catastrophe theory, you know, all that stuff about when a bridge breaks. And uh, it turns out to be extremely interesting as a musical source material. This actually maps the transformation of musical materials in space as it moves. So. We're articulating space in a huge variety of ways. Uh, the composer Henry Brandt made an entire um, uh, career out of, out of defining sound spaces with instruments in acoustic environments. Um, Zanakis himself was, um, of course, uh, educated as an engineer. Uh, but had a, a strong musical acumen and an, and an amazing vision in this transformation of, of design and life and perception in time and space domains and how to move back and forth between them. I happen to have had, uh, this is the second uh, thing I'd like to do, is just to give you actually a personal connection with him. Uh, you must know he's known for some landmark buildings and his work with Le Corbusier. Um, but his, his, uh, art, his uh, work in music became monumental and his uh, uh, application of uh, kinds of systems thinking was extremely um, influential. Here he is. I happened to be uh, in the early 1980s. I was... Uh, uh, the head of something called the Center for Contemporary Music at Mills College in Oakland. And I had the opportunity to bring Zanakis there for, an ex for a, a substantial residency, and we had a fantastic time. We um, decided that in several cases we would turn on a, a video camera and talk about music. And here is one case where he is uh, I'll give you a few little clips of him talking about, uh, about some of his ideas. This is from a seminar that he gave on uh, his work up to that time. Uh, the, the meaning of line was uh, a metaphor from which he developed a, his way of talking about music. And here's a clip in which he talks about everything is about points on a line, whether we're talking about lines in time or lines in space. And he uses it as a language to, to uh, uh, almost a universal language of talking about the uh, control of musical parameters. Uh, I apologize, this is ancient archival video, 35 years old or something, um, and it's, the quality is not great. You may have to strain a little bit to understand, but it's worth it. 
Oh, and just so you know, he was famous for, uh, for probabilistic systems uh, in which the, the movements of many small components, the many small components of a large sound complex, like uh, were controlled by probability uh, uh, methods, uh, like positioning each bee in a swarm of bees uh, in, uh, using probabilistic methods, but controlling the overall shape of the cloud. Uh, ap uh, appropriately, outside the window of this room in which he's talking, there was a pond filled with frogs that all decided to croak during the time that he's talking. So you're hearing a cloud of frogs behind Zanakis. from the very regular one, which we call deterministic, to the other n, this is very regular, to absolute irregularity, that is stochastic. Stochastic, which means probabilistic. Irregular, absolute irregularity. Absolute, abs. And music and everything in the world, in the universe, are oscillating between these two, at least as I think as science, is, science sees that you know, today still, oscillates between these two extreme poles, or in the Asian cultures, cultures in Africa or Africa. So he's making a very important point, that, and that was a, a worldview at that time, that, that we can de describe many systems in the universe as oscillating between, uh, between deterministic and indeterministic um, uh, poles which at that time were, were described largely by means of stochastic processes. Now we know that there can be deterministic processes that are also unpredictable, um, which we have learned from nonlinear dynamics. Uh, I'm going to move to another little clip here where he talks about taking shapes, musical shapes, and how he can take them uh, articulated in time and move them in space and turn them in space. And S. What I mean. Suppose that you rotate it slightly. You have that thing. It doesn't change. Well, you rotate it and you shift it. It doesn't change. But if you play it like this, rotate it like this, you have here, since you uh, scan this figure time wise from left to right as you used to do normally, suddenly here you have one and two arcs. One going that way, another one starting from here, going that way, another one that way. So you have something different from the initial form, which was simple. You have three lines coming up. And in between, you have the intermediate situation. <laughs> 
Now suppose that instead of having such a simple thing, you have a complex of lines like this, which would be a kind of generalization of linear thing, that's many lines, and of polyphonic thing. You can consider that as a bush, as an object, and then you can rotate it as you wish. So it becomes something completely different, and you increase, therefore, your, uh, <laughs> your capacities of uh, your action, the results of your action. This is, uh, it's kind of, I think it is in the dictionary, although, okay, arborescences. So arborescences, he, he, you see how easily he takes something which is drawn in time and then just turns it in space and then reinterprets it in time again. So this going back and forth has produced a tremendous richness in exploring new forms. So um, this could this could go on and on and on, but uh, I, I uh, would would uh, just move on by by saying uh, th this field in music is bigger than most people realize, and the degree to which sound artists really work with the concept of, of defining space with sound is, is uh, uh, something worth really studying. I remember having in the early 70s a conversation with the artist Robert Irwin, and we were talking about doing a project together, and the question that, was, that we were, were puzzling about was this, uh, is it possible to draw a line in space solely with sound? I've been trying to solve that problem for 30 years. <laughs> it's very, very difficult to figure out how to do that, but I'm, I can't give up the idea that it must be possible. Um, I'll just end with a couple of uh, little examples that are, are kind of fun. I happen to have the opportunity to um, uh, perform together with Zanakis on a festival in Mexico City in 1978. And we set up uh, at the College of Mexico. This is a, this is a, uh, uh, an open space. It's a, a beautiful modern building, and it has this big open space uh, with many, many balconies. This is not. A, this is just a, some audience member snapped a picture, as you can't really see. But there were, we had something like, I don't know, 48 channels of, of loudspeakers all around the balconies, and you can see down in the um, in the um, pit there where I'm sitting. Uh, you could right there a set of multi-track tape recorders, which were what Zanakis used to, to, as we call it, diffuse or mix and distribute sound around this big space. It was a beautiful event. Uh, you're seeing uh, me there right now because I uh, was uh, doing um, uh, an event in which I was actually uh, performing with signals from the brain. I've done a lot of work with music and neuroscience in which uh, the, the 48 channel surround system was, um, uh, sounds were being distributed and moved by uh, features of brain signals that were coming from, in this case, me. And you can see here the, uh, my getting set up and there performing. And it was uh, a, ser a series of pieces dealing with the, the idea of the mapping of certain kinds of conscious states of consciousness with, with uh, uh, looking at brain signals and bringing a sense of space uh, into a, into a, a space uh, that was bigger than, than the surrounding. I did one piece I don't have pictures from uh, in 1972 for the, in the Vancouver Art Gallery in which there was a light uh, tight space and there were peop uh, participants could be brought in, people who come to the came to the uh, gallery, and they would sit down on opposite sides of a two-way mirror system, and they would be fitted with electrodes. And uh, as, as certain spectral characteristics of their brain signals came into synchrony, uh, a lighting system would cause them to see their faces switch bodies. In other words, you want a 
person A would see their face on the other person's body and vice versa. And there was a sound environment brought in and embedded in the walls were very thin um, uh, light pipes. Or they were made out of plastic at that time. And they duplicated the horizon of the Vancouver mountainscape outside the gallery. So as you got into this brain state, the landscape came inside the space. It was pretty interesting. Here it was uh, about sound in this particular location, and which I'll leave you just with a little hint of what that sounded like. Sometimes it sounded like this. Sometimes it would sound more like something like this. Or this. Now imagine that moving around, not necessarily spinning, but moving all around, but in synchrony with, the, with aspects of the spectral characteristics of the, of the performer's brain signal. Thank you. I've always wanted to ask this question, and it has to do with both John Cage's music and Zanakis and what you've just demonstrated to us. So these compositional strategies that depend on uh, extrasonic kind of activities or mappings of one sort or another. Right. It, it must surprise you to hear the result of the systems which you set up. Could you talk about that? Is that sure. true? Sure, sure. Um, in fact, if it's not surprising, then it, it gets boring and you stop doing it. Uh, sound cognition. Uh, in which one can investigate just how much information you can actually obtain through the years. Um, and, and how uh, little attention we've paid to how that can be trained. So for example, uh, I'm, I'm leading to an answer to your question, I think. If the, the clouds of sounds of Zanakis I described, we know through training and testing that one can develop tremendous acuity in dif differentiating very, you know, cl such clouds with very, very tiny variations. Um, as long as you can tell that two things are different, it means that you are perceiving something. Now, how then you could map it into some sort of cognitive domain that tells you something that's about navigating through that, that space is something that takes experience and learning. But what is constantly exciting and surprising to me is that we can make, and I use the word in the title, propositional, and, and I, I, have, I write about something called propositional music, which, which is about the notion that you can actually imagine a universe. You can imagine a world uh, that is of your own conception. You can say, okay, what if, the, what if the universe worked like this? And then make music on the basis of what that universe would be and then traverse it and, exper uh, and explore it, like discovering a new mountain range and finding hills and valleys and, and, and waterfalls. And with your ears, learn to really actually parse it in a very, very interesting way. Our parsing capabilities with, with sound and our sonic differentiating capabilities are enormous. And we don't pay attention to, to them too much. I used to do uh, exercises with my students where I would uh, May, I would fill the room with why, uh, at least two sources of uncorrelated white noise and, ask, and have them simply learn to navigate in the space. And it turns out you can do it very well. You can, learn to, you can learn to move around, not bump into each other. You can learn to hear sonic shadows. You can learn to hear a hard surface because it has reflection in some way. You can hear a soft surface. And you can, you can tell there's a couch over here because there's a soft... You know, there's, you can get really good at it. 
And if we can do that, we can also perceive tiny subtleties in these made-up worlds. And as artists, we have tremendous license to be able to make them and not, like the scientists, have to prove that that's the way reality really is. So uh, with the freedom that, that we can bring to that, and as architects, the freedom that you can bring to making visual sonic realities that we actually live in, uh, it's incredible what we can learn to perceive. There is this obvious connection, not just obvious, but this uh, intrinsic connection uh, in uh, Zanakis's work with mathematics and also in your work. And um, what would be interesting to think about is the trajectory of, say, mathematics and physics today uh, in, in some ways, which seems to have, in terms of scale, become untangible, so small or so large uh, and so complex. What is the relation or the research that takes place with, say, contemporary physics, contemporary mathematics and sounds? Well, you, you'll certainly, we have a panelist who's going to take us into uh, an aspect of that world. Uh, uh, Curtis Rhodes, when he'll talk about microsonom, you can imagine that, that you're, you're seeing a reflection of, of the quantum world uh, when, you, when you look at, at particles like that. The, the, there are plenty of examples in, uh, in a number of composers' work, including my own, where, where the exploration of many of these models uh, actually appears in the, in the structure of, of, uh, of things. I'm thinking of, of one piece um, called Zones of Influence in which um, the probabilistic models are applied to uh, a, a system in which uh, it's actually a piece for a brilliant percussion soloist in which all the instruments are interfaced to a computer music system. And actually in every place where there's a sensor, there is a function that's cycling. And that function is uh, something that comes from the mathematics that are used to create what we call, what we call quantum wells, the, the shape of, of, a, of a force field that traps a particle where it can get stuck. But there's a complex of these, and, there, and there's a harmonic, almost a harmonic system. Uh, there is a system of integral, integer-related functions like the harmonic series in sound that, that uh, is related to these functions. They're called Laguerre polynomials. And, you, uh, and they, they cycle. And what they describe is the probability that if he hits an instrument at, that, at a particular time, it will trigger an electronic sound. So now the performer learns a new performance technique. He learns how to feel the rhythm of these functions, even though they're not actually displayed. Right? So that's a, that's a sort of a... It's, a, it's something that, you know, it's an inspiration from a mathematical idea that comes from physics, but it's an experiment in making it physically palpable, make it actually feel, mean something uh, in, the, in the physicality of the music. So, I mean, we could go on all night with examples like that. So there's lots, there's lots of interest in people investigating things like this. It's another way of experiencing possible realities. I'm 
Thank you.